So someone asked for a video on running through pine grow and I thought a great place to start. This is on in other videos, but I thought just make a quick five minute 101 video of the pine grow interface. So what I'm going to do here is just help you get familiar with all of the different components, all the different parts, and hopefully you'll be that less daunted when opening up pine grow. So let's rush through this because it's boiling right now but before we do that i just want to remind you there's a competition i'm running to win this bad boy that's my company's logo on a coffee cup um information in the description below good luck so when you open up pine grow you'll see uh you won't see this many projects because of course you may have opened it the first time but you can see all my projects here but you can also see that you can add a new page or a project. If you were to export your Webflow project and you can open it straight away in Pine Grow and start playing around with it like it's nobody's business. Um, you just gotta open that project and the files and, and Pine Grow just does the rest. Really, really easy transition. What you're probably gonna be doing is creating a new page or project and that's what we're gonna do right now. And then you're presented with a list of templates or default kind of setups where bootstrap is automatically included tailwind is automatically included uh, angular and various things like that materialize foundation um, all of these are kind of out the box and, and there are certain interfaces that uh, work well with these different um, tools and, and libraries but i tend to use plain html and the normalized version is obviously it if you don't know what normalize is it resets all of the browsers so that if you were to apply no styling they all look the same so by opening up this project here you're likely going to be seeing this um, window first now this is where all of your html is created if i want an image drag an image there if i want a nav drag it if I want a h2 drag it drag and drop baby all day long this is where you're creating all of your html you can also insert custom html so if i want a script tag here then i can do that write custom code uh, script and then just drag that into the page um, it also accepts pug now i don't know pug but my assumption is that if i do this it creates a div with header if i want a header with with a class of header then it um, it creates that and I just drag that onto the page. This is where all your HTML is created. This next panel here is the file tree of your website. Now I've already created a folder and, and saved my files, but you can see you've got the CSS here. Um, this is primarily where you just create new files and then you can obviously edit these files and they pop up down here like a lovely bubbly. So that's where your HTML is created. I change it slightly and we'll get into that. But moving on to the top here, I don't tend to zoom in on my page, but if you so want to, you can do that here. You can also change the, the actual layout itself, make it larger, make it smaller here. Um, I don't tend to touch that layout thing or edit inline text. This I use quite a lot, that if I have a button that triggers, say, some JavaScript, if I was to click on that button, for instance, it will just select that button. Okay, well, what if I want to actually trigger the JavaScript? Then I can click that and it will actually receive that click event. So that's quite handy there. This is to open up the code at the bottom. As you can see, I can then just write some code here. Now, what I just used there was Emmet. Emmet allows you to write really short um, snippets of code and it works on what you're trying to write here. It works in CSS as well, I believe, but how you get to that is if we go to support and settings, but you can use Emmet in the code editor there. So this is no code, so let's not worry about that right now. Um, we can turn on JavaScript and you'll need to turn on JavaScript when you use interactions and I've got videos on interactions. Refreshing the page, opening the page in a browser, pretty self-explanatory here. This is opening up a new page so I can have my mobile and my desktop side by side. Super handy that. Next along the line, we've got the multiplier. Now, if I want, if we go back to the HTML elements here and I wanted, say, um, six list items. I can press the number six, drag my list items, and it will create six list items on there. Super handy little shortcut that, but that just lets you know which number multiplier you're on. And I just use the numbers, so nice little indicator there. Um, never use the hide panels, but if you wanted a cleaner look, you can do that. And I never normally use focus mode. I always accidentally trigger it. Don't want to speak about it right now because I, I can't explain it, but that's what it is anyway. Jumping over to the right-hand side, now this is where you're going to be spending a lot of your time as well. 
this first one here, this activates a theme, which is great because then you can start to set some default styles on some of the most basic elements. You're basically creating a, a, um, a style system. Now I have never used this. This is kind of like HTML properties. So again, if I go on to, well, actually, if I just click my heading, then I get all of the um, HTML attributes that you would expect for a heading, ID, name, title, and you can even add your own um, data attributes or whatever it is you want. Next along is the class styles. So this is when there's a Tailwind project so um, um, or a Bootstrap project. Uh, you'll notice this populated with all the default Bootstrap or Tailwind styles, which then you can, you can adjust kind of like this, but for Bootstrap. Next, this is where a lot of your time is going to be spent, right? This is where all of the CSS styles exist. Um, they are named according to their CSS property. Now, Webflow, they will name things for your convenience. For instance, they name it font color. Well, color, font color in CSS is just color, and you'll see that there. But it's under the font grouping here, so you haven't got to worry too much about it. But click through these. You've just got, I implore you to explore. You've got all the CSS properties that you can apply to any of your elements. So with that being said, we've got our H2 selected here, and I can start to build my CSS properties here. And then you can see they get added to inline styles there. We don't like inline styles, but they can be very, very um, handy sometimes. What you might probably want to do if I delete that is start by creating a class. So heading one, there's a two, but whatever, and then create that style. Ask me to create a CSS file. And now I can add properties to this CSS uh, class. Now, if I wanted to bend it up and go heading one uh, red, create that style here, then again, there's the heading one and there's here's the modifier class. Go ahead and let's just change the color to red. And you can see these styles sort of building up here on the right hand side. You can also select your selectors, select your selectors, select your selectors here by clicking on these and then create that. And then you've got your selector there. But one thing we didn't go over which I thought could be helpful we're a day later by the way and I'm re-recording re this um, is media queries so I thought I'd just quickly demonstrate media queries so if we quickly it's a little bit bigger if we drag in a section here and on the style panel we can we can start to add media queries uh, if we wanted to my section add a new section here in fact actually we're going to create it um, we can add media queries here um, and we can type it all out or whatever, or you can manage your breakpoints up here and you can kind of create your own breakpoints. Now it prompts you to add the meta viewport, which is necessary for media crews to work. And then you can kind of add your breakpoints. So if we have this as 1024 pixels and close that, then when we create our class here, we can add a media query and then we can say smaller than 1024, uh, larger than 1024, um, and that's it. Or similarly, you can create the class and you can create all of your styles. So this might be a quite a common workflow. Um, and then you can add that to the media query down there. And then what you'll see is that if we make the window smaller, that class, that styling will actually disappear because it's not being applied. And then you get to see that uh, styling then applied there. So that's media queries in Pinegrow. One thing I like to do though, is actually convert my CSS to SAS and you can do that here. Uh, good thing about SAS is that you get auto prefixed styles that aren't available in certain browsers. Moving along, this is where your interactions exist and I've got plenty of videos on interactions. So I implore you to go and visit some of those videos, but this is where all your interactions are created here. Now this next one is my document tree. This is my DOM. Taken from Webflow, I actually prefer this to be down here and that's where you will probably become more familiar with the, the sort of interface. Um, I like this one just because my HTML stuff is kind of on the left hand side here and then my styles and JavaScript are on the right hand side. That's kind of why I move it there. But it's as you would expect, you can select elements like this, select elements like this. If I was adding elements, I can go here and drag them down here. Oftentimes what I like to do is right click, insert, and then select the appropriate 
element there so that's uh, that's that's how i tend to build my my html on from interactions then this is where your components are and it's pretty self-explanatory i'm sure you can create components you can um, reuse components you can build master templates for certain files and you do all that in the components panel and i, I you know Go and play. Go and play with them. There's, there's some really powerful things you can do. You can allow things to be repeated. You can allow things to be editable. Um, really, really powerful component um, interface there. Now, Pinegro is a very, very powerful WordPress theme creator. Um, I've got a video on how I just had no intentions. I just jumped in and started creating a theme, and I was able to create a theme very, very quickly. So. Really enjoy their, their ability to create WordPress themes. This is where it lives there. Now, I turn some of these off in the workspace. Uh, where is it? Show high panels. I, I tend to hide some of those. I don't care about the WordPress one, of course, when I'm not using a WordPress um, theme or anything like that, but you can kind of customize them there. Other aspects potentially could be if you want to bring in some libraries under file, you've got libraries and plugins here. Again, you can you can you can bring in foundation if you didn't choose it from the beginning. And I think that's it. That's uh, I don't know how long that was, but I tried to get through it as quickly as possible as a quick primer to the Pine Grow interface. If you want me to elaborate on any specific thing that we touched on here, then leave a comment below. Um, if you see something that someone's already suggested and they want a video on, like that comment. So if you're learning Pine Grow and want to learn from me, then hit the subscribe button. I'll be so happy to have you in here. If you want to join my Discord and ask me questions on there, then I'll leave a link below to that. So feel free to join the Discord. And I think that's everything. It's so hot in here. I'm going to go jump in a bath of raisins. Thanks for sticking around and I'll see you in the next one. Happy building the future of the web.